Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next panel, Crowding In versus Crowding Out, How XM Attracts Private Sector Activity. Our moderator is Joseph Monaghan, Executive Managing Director, AON. He's joined by Gemma Bay, Managing Director and Head of Structured Export Finance Americas, ING Capital. Dan Reardon, President, Global Political Risk, Credit and Bond Insurance, AXA and AL. And Doug Steenland, Chairman, AIG. So good morning, uh, everyone. There, the crowd is filtering in here this morning. Um, glad to be uh, part of the discussion this morning and part of a great uh, panel. Uh, we were talking earlier this morning um, uh, as we were preparing for this, and I think there's a lot of similar uh, views here, but we're all approaching it from a little bit of a different angle. So in the spirit of the late great Tom Petty, who when asked how does he write songs, he said one phrase, don't bore us, get to the chorus. We're going to go down the list here really quickly. Does XM crowd in or crowd out capital? So in or out, Gemma? In. In. Doug? Uh, in. Dan? In. In. Thank you. So enjoy the rest of the... Uh... <laughs> What's interesting about this, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we're all approaching it from a little bit uh, different perspective. So at Aon, uh, we had the good fortune of representing Exim last year on their inaugural uh, risk transfer on an aviation portfolio, uh, which was a, a, a great example of the public-private partnership that we're discussing today. Um, but there are many other examples, and I think maybe Gemma, starting with you, uh, and the work you do in aviation finance, um, can you give us some of the perspective that we were talking about a little bit earlier of that role of XM in combination with private capital in the aviation marketplace? So as a, as a financier and as a, uh, from a lender perspective, uh, we at ING, um, are, uh, there are basically two sectors that we have focused in the last 15 or so years, and that has been um, financing Boeing commercial aircraft to airlines all over the world as well as um, satellites from SSL and from, um, from Boeing. And um, the transaction that we were involved with Exim Bank for many of those transactions for, for airlines that are located in emerging market, what I would call challenging countries in terms of risk appetite uh, from a lender's uh, perspective, as well as certain types of new types of assets that the private capital market would not readily embrace or for many airlines that are located in the OECD countries but are just starting up. So I think for there, if it had not been for Exim Bank, we would not have been able to finance transactions for Ethiopian Airlines for, or for WestJet when they're just starting to start up their operations in Canada. So clearly Exim Bank played a catalyst role in mobilizing capital for those airlines to develop their business in difficult and challenging marketplaces. And I would say the same thing for satellite. I think the satellite industry is still struggling without excellent support. And we have seen a number of deals where Boeing is losing because there's a lack of ECA financing for their contract. And is, you know, we'd love to see Exxon Bank to support some of our key exporting clients so that they would have 11 playing field vis-a-vis -vis their French counterparts. And maybe uh, building on that and staying with aviation as a theme, Doug, you know, your background um, in aviation and in aviation lease finance, you know, maybe you could give a little bit of perspective in terms of the growth of that marketplace recently and the cyclicality of that marketplace sure. and good times and bads and the role of XM or ECAs in particular when things get choppy. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, two things that I've done in my past is one, for a good period of time, AIG was the owner of an entity called ILFC, which is the largest aircraft leasing company at that point. We had about 1,100 uh, commercial jets, and I was the chairman of that. And then prior to my AIG experience, I was the CEO of Northwest Airlines and merged it into Delta, and so saw it from that perspective. And I would just make two points. One is that over the last, so 10 years, ago, 10 years or so, the operating lease part of the business has dramatically expanded. And what that's involved is bringing in fresh capital and creating new 
uh, vehicles to basically finance Boeing and Airbus airplanes. Having said that, you know, we've sort of gotten used to having robust uh, private capital markets that have been eager to finance this pretty unique asset. Uh, but that has not always been the case. And if you look back in time, uh, you can see multiple instances where the private capital market effectively dried up and was closed uh, to aircraft financing. And obviously, from the OEM perspective, that's a, uh, that's a serious, serious problem because they've got their production facilities for the whole supply chain. Uh, you know, they're all geared up to continue to produce. You can't just turn that off. Uh, and in those instances, what's proven to be very effective is both XM and ECA sort of stepped up and, you know, turned the faucet more open than historically had been the case. And I think it's problematic today that, you know, XM may not be able to play that role because of restraints attached. But knowing that, you know, in times of need and in times of when there is a seizure in the private market, there is in essence a backstop that can bridge until the private markets open back up again, I think is, a, is an important piece of the overall puzzle for financing these billions and billions of dollars of, uh, of aircraft that are, that are being introduced into the market. So Dan, you were one of the leaders in terms of the um, aviation insurance program that was put in place. And I wondered if you could give a little bit of an overview of that um, transaction. Uh, and you have, a, I think, an interesting perspective given your background in OPIC. Um, prior to your background in the insurance business, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the relationship that has developed between Exim and the private insurance marketplace on the back of that transaction. Sure, Joe, I'm happy to. So we were at XXL, very proud to lead, along with uh, six other carriers, uh, this, uh, what I think is a landmark step by, by the Exim Bank to crowd in, the answer to your question, certainly crowd in uh, available capacity in the markets and the insurance markets um, to look at an aircraft portfolio. I think there were 33 different airlines uh, covering a billion dollars worth of exposure. Uh, it, is, uh, it is arguably one of the best classes of business for Exim Bank, no doubt, but it is important to start. It is the first time that Exim really came to the market in a significant way to pull in that capital, to pull in the insurers to support their business. Um, there will, I think, be further needs, and there are further needs. Certainly, uh, certainly challenging times in terms of the capacity that, that, uh, that Exim can provide, uh, but that, that innovation that happened last year, it's a two-year facility um, led by Aon, too, uh, that, you know, that starts something that could be replicated, and it created a model um, with great team members at Exim Bank to really launch that, to take the steps to get that into the market. Um, I believe, firmly believe there'll be other opportunities. And I know there's a lot of discussions about innovation, even ways to kind of leverage the $10 million cap, uh, to pull in private capital to support aircraft, um, other aerospace, satellite, uh, looking at shipping, other mobile assets. I think there'll be quite a bit. Um, the relationship you know, with OPIC is interesting because OPIC has just had a vastly expanded uh, mandate. Um, we hope that, uh, that that same drive to kind of expand these programs, particularly for agencies that are looking to pull in the private sector in such a way, and I can tell you OPIC is highly engaged with the private sector uh, in, their, in their lending uh, as well as with their insurance products. So we, we think it's, those are good models. And we think that that actually helps the agencies meet the demand, because our view is that it's a growing market, the pie is expanding, there's need for more capacity, and I think this public-private collaboration that we've seen grow is going to be important for that in the future. And you touched on something that I think is important to bring out, which is not only um, the capital that is provided by the ECAs, the guarantee that's provided um, by Exim, but also the expertise in underwriting the risk, the expertise in going into geographies that are more challenging for private capital to enter, especially if there hasn't been a lot of activity historically. And Gemma, maybe you can talk a little bit about that 
Um, you mentioned satellite, for example, yeah. as a great exa uh, example of that. Can you talk a little bit about how you view the role of XM in terms of their underwriting exp expertise and the ability, given the nature of XM, to right. enter geographies where private capital may not be able to confidently go in? Right. So prior to focusing on aviation and satellite in particular, um, my prior experience um, and working with XM Bank has been really been emerging markets. And I think if you go back and you look at the very first project finance deals in Indonesia or in Brazil and Argentina, it was the ECAs that led the very first project finance deals in those difficult countries where you're not only taking you know, political and, and transfer and, 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 and the foreign exchange risk and expropriation risk, you know, the lenders also were faced, sponsors were also faced with construction risk, project risk, PPA risk. And the ECAs, and Exim in particular, in their late 90s and early 2000s, led the very first structure and set the example of how to analyze project risk, construction risk, PPA risk. And so if Exim and the ECAs did not establish the ground rules and set up certain guidelines how to analyze this project risk, I don't think today we would have private sector looking at those types of structures. So clearly, XM and ECAs are critical in establishing new types of structure that enables and mobilizes private sector. And I think that we have benefited hugely from the experience that XM brings, because at the end of the, at the, end of the day, XM would only take on projects if there is reasonable assurance that they're going to get repaid, right? So they're not underwriting just because they, you know, it's US government. So the amount of due diligence and the credit review that Exim undertakes on whether it's a project in Indonesia, whether it is in you know, Brazil or Argentina, they go through the same rigor of underwriting assessment. And I think that that tr brings a tremendous comfort as a lender because we know that Exim has undertaken all of the legal, technical, and due diligence to ensure that the project is a sound project that they're willing to guarantee and that gives a rubber of AAA stamp so as a lender, we take a lot of comfort. So even today, I think that if you're doing a project, a renewable deal in difficult, challenging markets, without ECAs, the private capital will not be there to support those projects. So I think it's very critical that they do play a major role of setting, ground, setting rules that allows private capital to come in and to provide the necessary funding. Yeah, and you know, we all know that the world is awash in capital. And Doug, we were talking at breakfast about, you know, how much capital is out there. But there's a difference between pools of capital and pools of capital that are ready to take risk, that have confidence in risk taking. And maybe you could talk a little bit. I thought it was interesting talking about the pools of capital out there that are looking for longer term investment opportunities, and we think about infrastructure finance or renewables, that combination of needing leadership on the ground floor to get a project off the ground, and then terming that financing, refinancing into more fixed um, uh, debt or other financing opportunities to access that stable capital. Yeah, I, th <clears throat> I think there's a, uh, a confluence between uh, institutions that want to you know, recycle their capital. So, you know, fewer and fewer institutions want to extend credit, take on risk, and then, you know, keep that risk on their balance sheet forever and ever, as compared to, you know, originating the risk, seasoning it, and then laying it off on third parties. And then I think you've got pools of capital that are, are becoming more niche-like in that they're developed, you know, they exist and they're looking for particular kinds of risk. And, you know, there's an emerging group that's looking for, for as an example, for longer dated uh, risks. So they want to they look for assets that have, you know, 20, 25 year uh, lives to them where they can expect a reasonable return over that period of time and in essence want to lock up their money for that period of time because they're either matching it against you know, liabilities that have that type of tenor uh, or their sovereign wealth funds that are looking to park money for that period of time and don't want to constantly recycle that. And so I think for an entity like an Exim Bank that can 
you know, be an origin originator of, of a project and the like that private capital may not be willing to do, I think there are opportunities for, for whether it's, you know, following on the aircraft example uh, of looking for them to recycle that capital and bring in the specific pool of third party, you know, private investment that's looking for that type of asset to put on its balance sheet and, um, and invest in. You know, Dan, AXA XL, like AIG, like ING, are all private entities that at the end of the day are risk evaluators, putting capital to work, assessing opportunities, and looking for a risk reward. And, you know, as you think about building out your portfolio and as we think about building on the momentum of the recent transaction with Exum. I thought it was interesting yesterday when you talked about um, AXA's recent acquisition of Excel and the opportunity you had to present. And the first transaction you presented was actually the Exum transaction. So one of the things in the insurance and certainly in the reinsurance business is this concept of underwriting the underwriter mm -hmm. and the role of an entity that you have confidence in, Doug, to your point, who's on the ground with the origination of the risk in their ability to underwrite that risk and an alignment of incentives. And can you talk about, you know, how XM, there are areas you may want to go into and deploy capital or to take risk, but having XM as a partner just builds a lot more confidence, not only for you and your team, but also within the organization. Sure, sure, Joe. So I think that, you know, that's a, that's a good concept for us because actually fits pretty well with our business strategy at, at XXL, right? We are, we are one of a few members of the private insurance community that's quite interested in longer term risks, um, particularly those involving challenging risk, complex risk, uh, renewable energy, um, some, of the, some of the aircraft financings that we see, some of the project financings that we see in energy and other areas. Uh, those, are, those are challenging. They're often presented to us in challenging markets uh, as well. Um, in Africa and other, other, other single B or double B type uh, rated markets. Um, for us, uh, we, have, we have, I think, some of the best ex expertise in the underwriting side, certainly in the risk analysis side, and even on the claims and the mitigation side. But it is an enhancement for us if we can work on these long-term projects with Exum, with other multilaterals or ECAs, all right, particularly for the long-term nature of them. Now, the fact is, with a lot of project financings, Right, there is capital that likes to come in after you get through the construction period, right? The so-called mini perm financings, where you see, you know, you have to be an originator, right? We see ourselves as really as supporting those originators um, with a with a multilateral, with an ECA, particularly for the longer, most complex risks in the difficult markets. Um, but we also have to be prepared to stay with those risks for the long term, right? Because while the the markets are strong and robust right now, um, that won't always be the, the case. So when we're underwriting that risk, we're not counting on that risk to come off our books in, in two to five or seven years. We're counting on it being there for 15, 16, 20 years or longer. Um, so we have to be taking that into account. So the expertise of, of Exim in particular uh, for longer term risks, for being able to manage complex risks in aviation and energy and renewable energy in particular, that matters to us a great deal. And it's not just the underwriting expertise, it really is the mitigation expertise, that hands-on experience uh, that they have in managing complex risks in emerging markets um, matters for us. Um, we also think the halo effect of the U.S. government doesn't hurt, right? So certainly that's a, that's a good thing for us as well. Yeah, maybe building on that last comment, um, there's a um, significant conversation yesterday during the session around um, China and the uh, enormous role they have in this uh, space. And we talk a lot about public-private partnerships and in China in terms of the multiple ways the government is doing public-public, frankly, partnerships and driving this. Um, maybe, Doug, from your perspective, this combination of public-private partnerships um, strikes me as a way to compete effectively um, with, for, the, for example, China. Um, they have objectives they're trying to achieve, um, and it doesn't seem like a single actor um, can necessarily have the same ability to achieve those objectives, but could public-private partnership and combination be um, useful as a tool? 
it can. I think the challenge is when the sort of return profile of a, you know, a, a Chinese entity providing financing turns out to, you know, is lower than what the return profile that the capital that might be in this private public partnership requires. So, you know, if you think about if you think about it from a sort of a US insurance perspective, you know, the you know, the overall portfolio, I mean, I think AIG manages or has about 350 billion of assets that it manages. The lion's share of it is in, you know, plain Jane corporate bonds. That's what the regulators expect and the like. And then there's an allocation that goes towards alternative assets that you are allowed to take a, you know, a larger risk on and the like. But you're still obviously, you've got a return profile that you have to meet in that instance. And if you're competing to finance an asset or the like, and the competitor on the other side is able to live in a world where they're more than willing to fund at 200 basis points less than what your return hurdle is, that's not a good recipe for success. And nine times out of 10, you're gonna lose that. And then time will tell whether the, you know, the lower return profile of who the competitive entity is, you know, they warranted you know, doing that, but a lot of times, you know, they're not measuring themselves based on what their return is over the long term. They're measuring themselves on market share. They're measuring themselves on a whole other series of objectives that might be unique to the country that's the sponsor of that entity that doesn't necessarily translate into, you know, a direct competitive economic um, set of circumstances. So it, it, it can be very challenging. And you know, that building on that in terms of um, private capital obviously is looking to achieve accretive returns, right? So um, private capital to the extent that it can find ways to lower its cost of capital. And we were talking earlier, Gemma, about the tools to lower a bank's cost of capital. Um, that varies quite a bit by regulatory authority and the tools available to a European bank versus a US bank and the role that XM or ECAs play um, to complement capital structures in a way that perhaps other forms of private third party capital because of regulatory restrictions aren't as effective. And maybe you can talk a little bit about those uh, opportunities that ECAs have, particularly with US banks versus European banks. As, as you know, we are obviously a Dutch bank, ING, so we are, I mean, currently, you know, the capital requirement that we have to follow is the Basel III, and of course we have the European, you know, bank regulation. So in addition to Exim playing this catalyst role as, as a lender, you know, the, we have a finite amount of capital that ING will deploy for all their business we do in the wholesale banking as well as retail banking. So there is, you know, scarcity of capital because we cannot allocate capital across all our business lines all over the world. So where we maximize ECA is that because they are, at the end of the day, full faith and credit of the sovereign government of the respective ECA, we get relief on capital. So we can deploy more capital because the capital that we allocate and the risk-weighted asset we have to allocate support transaction in Ethiopia or in Zimbabwe is very tiny compared to the overall capital that we have, we have. So that allows us to do more with very little. And many times, along with ECA financing, we would offer complementary financing, meaning the 15% down payment portion, because many of the, the borrowers want 100% financing. So with ECA covering 85% of the contract price, with very little capital and risk-weighted asset, we can then deploy the, some amount of capital to support the 15% down payment portion. Many times with a CPR cover, from the likes of AXA XL. So, you know, it is really critical that as we go into Basel IV, the capital allocation are gonna vary much more um, stringently than on the Basel III. So the capital Basel IV, which is gonna start rolling out in year 2020, really is going to discourage European banks that are currently doing asset-based lending because they are now no longer gonna get relief on capital if they're, what they're uh, for the likes of aircraft or ships or thing. 
So it is critical that Exim stays on because the lack of ECA will now allow lenders like ING to continue to provide some the same type of financing we can do currently. So it's not only a risk perspective, it's also a capital allocation and risk-weighted asset that we are required to allocate. And I think that you know, with the European ECAs, right, and, and for US exporters, if we want to continue to support our US exporting clients, Exim has to be there, otherwise we will not be able to provide the same kind of financing that our counterparts can do for their, competitive, for their exporting clients. And you know, I think maybe, Jim, is staying with you for a moment. Yeah. Um, XM and, and building on the success of the transaction, the insurance transaction, uh, XM is, uh, even with the restraints in terms of the size uh, and tenor um, restrictions, is working very hard to be creative and working with lenders and working with insurers to bring their expertise to bear and the confidence that everyone in the structure um, gains by having XM involved. Um, they're working very hard to be innovative and still try to find solutions even within those restrictions. And maybe Gemma and then Dan, you can build on that. Talk a little bit about some of those conversations. Yeah, so, so the current lady, you know, I mean, Exim is still, you know, $10 million authorization. And so it's not a huge amount of money, but I think that there are uh, pockets of opportunities and we are in discussions with Exim's transportation division in particular and in the structured finance division where we can take the Exim guarantee portion for 10 million and use that to top up a financing that ING would do so that at the end of the day, it's not just 10 million that we could offer to our client, but maybe we could offer 15, 20, in some cases, $30 million. So given the, all the concern that Exim currently has, I do think that this, you know, and they're trying to be very creative and, uh, and it's gonna, you know, and again, it, it may not work for all of our clients, but I think that there are opportunities that we can use to leverage Exim's 10 million and offer, uh, and we're willing to you know, top up because the Exim's umbrella does help us. We get relief, at least on the capital for the 10%, we get full relief on capital. And therefore we can then focus on the top up portion. So I think that's something that we are very keen to explore further with, with Exim. Yeah, I think as an insurer, we are looking to support similarly, right? So um, Exim, it's 10 million and no more than seven years, right? So that presents some challenges, but that doesn't mean that there aren't areas for cooperation. And certainly we're spending good time with very innovative people at Exim looking at how we can create some structures to support projects. Uh, maybe those are smaller projects. They could be larger projects where a private insurer like us could front the transaction with, with Exim being a, a reinsurer, or we could be side by side. So I think those are some of the options that we're exploring right now. Um, I love the enthusiasm of the teams. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of enthusiasm, and they you know some of those team members have been through thick and thin, uh, and they're probably still in a lot of thick. But they're 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 committed uh, to finding ways, and we're committed to be supporting them. I mean, you know, one one thing, and you talked about the competition, the global competition, right? We're members of the Bern Union, International Organization Export Credit and Investment Insurance, and um, there are there are many members of that group that are growing rather rapidly. Probably the Chinese, uh, the the most rapid, uh, and 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 they're not missing a beat in terms of supporting their companies and providing those types that type of support. Um, but also importantly, uh, you know, there, there's more private market participation, and that private market participation, as evidenced by the aircraft finance portfolio, is interested in working with Exxon. Uh, and you know, and, and we had we had a meeting of that team yesterday. Uh, that there's there's definitely more that can be done there, and uh, I think it's important. It's also important to recognize in our area of political risk, credit type of business globally, whether it's public or private, right? The, the total premium, and you know, we do look at premium, we do look at our returns, but the total global premium in the market is probably about $20 billion. Uh, what I think you, the important thing is you have large companies like the AXA Group who are committed to these product lines, right? Last year our, our return, our, our turnover was 120 billion, right? So you have big balance sheets, right? AIG is not a small balance sheet either, right? Uh, you know, big balance sheets looking to support Exim and to support the business, and I think that bodes well for the public-private collaboration that we uh, we all want to have. And you know, maybe uh, Doug, just some final thoughts from you. One of the uh, strengths, especially in the U.S. capital markets, is the ability for risk takers to find opportunities 
um, to deploy capital at a risk level that they're comfortable with. Securitizations, there are people who like being down in equity, right. people who like being in senior positions. And maybe you can talk about the strength of the marketplace as a result of that and how Exim fits into creating a more stable environment. Well, I think the, as Jem indicated, I think the, the US capital markets are the most innovative and the most efficient in the world. Uh, and they're constantly you know, creating new vehicles, coming up with uh, new schemes. You know, there's this term out there called brains in a jar of people who simply sit around and think about you know, structures and the like to develop and invent. And so in that world, there's, there's, there's plenty of opportunity to participate. And I think having a, a, a sort of the good housekeeping seal of approval and the imprimatur that XM brings, notwithstanding at the levels that it can participate in, there will be plenty of opportunities for it to make its contribution and for it to sort of you know, grease the wheels of, uh, of asset finance and, and the like going forward. With that, I think our time is up, at least that's what the big red sign says. And I want to thank our uh, panelists for a great discussion today. And thank the audience. Thanks,